Hello there and welcome to another live chapter reading for Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Today I shall be reading from Hell Hath No Fury, Life is Hell Book 2 by Naomi Valkyrie. Chapter 1 Millicent I've never felt unsafe in Juniper Lake until now. After years of travelling another life as a flight attendant, I'd settled here in this nowhere town because it was peaceful. Being a deputy here used to mean checking in with the locals and driving leisurely around the back roads. Lately, though, things have shifted. I can't put my finger on it, but something is different. Of course, two murders and a missing person will shake a person up, especially when you're the one who ended up being the first cop, first on the scene to see a beheaded corpse. The feds took over that case, but I don't know if they ever solved it. I've never checked on the progress because I never want to think about that day ever again. It's not our case anymore, and good riddance. The other murderer, the other murderer is still with our department, but we've made little progress. Not a lot of conclusive evidence to lead to any suspects, and we have no trail to find the missing girl, Bethany, who used to be a server at the diner. Amid all the upheaval, the sheriff, Malachi, Fontaine, and the other deputy, Orrin Evermore, have been exhibiting uncharacteristic behaviour. There have been days I've had to pull double shifts, which is highly unusual. Malachi and Orin have always been good to me, treated me as an equal, so I've let it slide for a bit. But I'm getting the feeling there's more going on around here that I need to know about. After unlocking my front door, I walk in and set my mail down on the foyer table, intending to look at it later. I've just come off a double and I'm beat. Hanging my hat and keys on the hook by the front door, I double check to make sure I lock the back door. In my sleuth-deprived state, I can't leave anything to chance. Once I've confirmed the locked door, I make my way to the bedroom and button in my uniform as I go. I'm too exhausted to take a shower, but I'll be damned if I sleep in my uniform. Once I'm in my oversized sleep shirt, I crawl into bed, barely registering my head hitting the pillow before the exhaustion overtakes me. Since Malachi has given me the day off to catch up on some rest after so many double shifts, I sleep until early afternoon before my body wakes me up to eat. Without bothering to get dressed, I go out to the kitchen and scrounge around for food. I've been working so much lately that I haven't gone grocery shopping and it looks like I'm down to a choice between cold cereal or toaster pastries. Pouring the cereal out in a bowl, I then grab the milk out of the refrigerator to pour over it. Upon opening the container, the smell of rotten milk assaults my nostrils. Looks like I'm having toaster pastries. After pouring the cereal back into the box, box and the expired milk down the drain, I pop the pastries into the toaster and wait. A couple of minutes later, with pastries in hand, I grab a book I've been trying to finish for the past month and go sit on my back porch in the lounge chair. It isn't until I get myself settled in that I realise I forgot to get a drink. Feeling too lazy to mess with it, I open my book and start reading. Chapter 2. Millicent. Someone whispering my name startles me awake. Rubbing the sleep out of my eyes, I try to get my bearings. My book is on the ground by my chair. It must have fallen off my lap when I dozed off. Looking around, I don't see anyone, even though I swear I heard someone calling me. I'm pretty sure now that I must have been dreaming. Retrieving my book, I make my way to the back door and go inside. Right as the door is closing, someone whispers my name again and a breeze brushes past my face. Shoving the back door open, I look over my, out over my backyard. Nothing. I've been working rather long hours lately, so maybe I'm hearing things. The breeze was probably just the door shutting. Shaking off the weird feeling creeping up my spine, I close the door and head to my room for a shower. The warm shower should relax me, but I keep feeling like someone is watching me and that worries me. It's paranoia settling in. I move through my routine quickly, visions of an intruder murdering me in the shower spurring me on. I hate that my feeling of safety is compromised. Why did a murderer have to choose Juniper Lake? Pulling back the shower curtain, I reach for a towel on the rack near me, but end up letting out a shriek as I see a set of eyes flash in the darkened room outside of the bathroom door. Once my heart slows down, I glare at Samantha. Damn cat. After yanking the towel down while drying off, I ask, Where have you been, troublemaker? Catch any mice? Sam meows loudly and then prances off like she didn't just scare ten years off my life. Once I'm dried off, I put on a pair of jeans and a blue t-shirt. It's my day off, but I'm too uneasy to stay home. I'll go to the station and take another look at the cases we have. Maybe if I can find a lead in Kiran's death or Bethany's disappearance, it'll take my mind off being creeped out. Problem solving helps me to focus. Walking out into the kitchen, I make sure Sam has food and water. Not that she'll be hanging out here. That cat does her own thing most of the time. Snagging my keys off the hook, I head outside, locking the door behind me. 
Looking around my front yard, everything looks as it should, but I can't shake the strange feeling I have. Getting into my car, I head towards the station, preparing for the scolding I'm likely to get for working on my day off. I park my car in front of the building, get out and walk up to the double doors. Taking a deep breath, I light myself in the building, prepared to defend myself, but I met with silence. Hello, I call out. Nothing but silence. I'm not sure whether I should feel relieved or disappointed. I'd worked up quite the energy preparing to argue and now it appears unnecessary. Heading to my desk, I pull out the file folders I need and boot up my computer so I can see the digital files too. If I'm about 20 minutes into my review and analysis of the file, files and I hear voices. Looking up, I see Malachi and his girlfriend Delilah heading in. Millicent, what are you doing here on your day off? Malachi asked when he sees me. Going over Kiran and Bethany's files. I'll feel better when we know what happened to them. I don't miss the look that Malachi gives Delilah. What? Malachi clears his throat. Well, remember when I called and asked you to work overtime the last time and you told me I needed to tell you what was going on at some point? Yes. I think it's time I told you what's going on. A sinking feeling hits me in the stomach. I wanted to know why everything seems off, but now that I'm about to find out, I wonder if I'd be better off not knowing. The serious expression on Malachi's face is not reassuring. Just as Malachi is about to launch into his explanation, Orin walks in the door. Hey all, how's it going? We're about to film Millicent in on recent events, Malachi says. Well, I'll see you later. I just remembered I need to go patrol Miller Road, Orin says as he turns and pushes the door open. Get back here, you coward, Delilah says with a laugh. Can't blame me for trying. This isn't going to be pleasant, Orin looks at me. Sorry, Millicent. Once the three of them are situated, Malachi launches into, into the conversation with no fluff. What I'm about to tell you is going to sound ludicrous, but it's the truth. Daxon, Kiran and Bethany were all murdered. Oren and I covered up some details. We never found Bethany's body to bury. Delilah killed them and tried to kill Oren, but it wasn't her fault. A tree of witches had her bound to them, so she had no choice but to do what they ordered. Delilah's a demon, Oren is a demon hunter and I'm a fallen angel, together with the help of Teval, another demon, Hadashah, an angel, and Jezebel, a shifter, we broke the witch's hold and took them all out. Malachi takes a breath, then finishes his word vomiting. Oh, and Caspian is my boyfriend, and a nix. It's so silent in the station that you could hear a pin drop. Suddenly laughter bubbles out, up and out of me, I can't stop it. It borders on the hysterical because some parts of me knows he's telling the truth, or he believes he is. Finally, I get a hold of myself. You expect me to believe that pile of horseshit? How gullible do you think I am? Malachi turns to Delilah and nods. I watch as there the shimmer around her head and two horns appear, seemingly out of nowhere. As if that wasn't enough, her eyes turn glass. black. Oh shit, I gasp. A wave of anger washes away the shock. How long were you planning on keeping this from me? If I hadn't asked, would you ever have told me? Millicent, I understand why you're upset, Malachi starts. Do you? Do you understand how much fighting Daxon's beheaded corpse affected me? And you fucking knew who did it, but you let me believe it was a serial killer. I turn off my computer and throw the files in my desk drawer, then head for the door. Millicent, wait, Orin calls after me. I ignore him completely and keep going. After unlocking my car, I get in and slam the door. The events that have transpired this afternoon have pretty much killed my paranoia. At least I know there's not a serial killer on the loose. No, no. Now I have other things to worry about. Demons, angels, shifters, witches. Did I wake up inside some kind of fairy tale after I took a nap? Still fuming, I pull into my driveway and turn the car off. Leaning my head up, back on the driver's seat headrest, I close my eyes and take a few deep breaths. I need to think and I won't be able to do that if I'm all worked up. Slowly I open my eyes and exhale. The setting sunlight catches on a crystal pendant hanging from my rearview mirror, creating a kaleidoscope of tiny rainbows. For a second I find it beautiful, then realise I don't keep a pendant on my mirror. Inspecting a crystal I realise that it's not even mine, I've never seen it before, and a chill creeps down my spine. Who put this in my car? With shaking fingers I reach up to remove it from the mirror, but just as I'm about to touch it the pendant disappears. Closing my eyes, I whisper, I'm tired and I just had a bunch of heavy information dumped on me. I am not going crazy. I breathe in deeply, hold it and then exhale. I am not going crazy. 
Slowly I open my eyes again. A brief squeak leaves me as, my f as a face suddenly appears, causing me to clutch my hat. Damn cat, it's like she lives to torture me. Sam looks down over the roof and of the car through the windshield and yells loudly at me. Shaking my head, I open the car door. But before I can shut it, Sam leaps down from the roof and darts inside. Get out of there, you troublemaker. Of course, being a cat, she doesn't listen and keeps poking her nose around the dashboard and windshield. Reaching in, I pick her up and pull her out and close the door. There's nothing you need in there, silly. With cat in hand, I head towards my house. Maybe a quiet evening of reading or a movie marathon will settle me down. I hope you enjoyed listening to this chapter reading and that you'll go check out the book. Thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.